Uh, so I want to thank everybody for signing up for the course. Um, so this will be my first doing or first time doing something like this. I haven't really taught anything before, so uh, apologies in advance, and I hope you'll bear with me. So if I go too fast on something, feel free to interrupt me, ask questions. Um, today is really just going to be kind of a basic overview. I've got a calendar slide here. Uh, just kind of go over what the next couple days look like. Um, we're not going to really get too deep into the weeds on any specific wargaming topic, but the goal is to kind of give a brief overview, starting with, you know, what does wargaming even mean as a word? Um, and then going over, you know, what's the difference between, you know, some of the different methodologies, um, different scale, so tactical, operational, strategic. I know a lot of people use those words a lot, but we'll go over what they actually mean for wargaming. Uh, and then when we're done here, we'll just kind of have a little Q and a session. If anyone has specific questions, um, and then I'll, I'll tell you what your assignment's going to be when it comes to the assignments for the lecture, for the course itself. Um, don't feel pressured. Like you have to, you know, change your life schedule to get them done. It's really just meant as thought exercises for you to kind of get you thinking about wargaming a little differently. And it'll give me a chance to kind of understand, you know, how your brain works, how you think about problems and what kind of things might interest you in the future. So this is going to be uh, what the month of April looks like for us. So today, um, today we are doing the uh, lecture one. 7 p.m. Eastern time for those of you who are international. If the Google Meet didn't work, um, let me know. I'll try to figure out a better time conversion tool. Uh, and then you'll see this Thursday we'll have the second lecture where we actually start going a little deeper into some of these topics. And the first assignment is due uh, Thursday before that lecture. It's just a one-page minimum assignment. We'll go over what that is at the end of this. And then you can see it's pretty much just copy and paste for the rest of this month. However, at the last week of April, uh, we will be getting everybody up to speed on Vassal. Vassal is a free software that allows you to play tabletop games in a digital format. So because we're all virtual, it'll just allow us to be able to play some tabletop war games that are pretty simple uh, through our computers together. Is there any questions about the schedule or how it's going to look like for this month. All right. So what is wargaming? Uh, so wargaming is a concept in a system or uh, a way to do things more than it is a defined game or a term. Uh, so for those of you who already have wargaming experience, some of this might be a little redundant, but for those of you who don't have any wargaming experience, uh, before I got involved in the industry, I would hear the term, you know, wargame or wargaming all the time. Didn't really understand what it meant. Um, from my perspective back then, I thought it was a bunch of officers going to the field and having people, you know, move around heavy equipment and things and looking at a map. Uh, Wargaming means many different things. So if you ask different professionals, they'll come up with different definitions. But at, as, at its core, it is just a concept and a system of doing things. So they can range from simple board games to complex computer simulations. They can cover you know, historical events, uh, hypothetical events, futuristic scenarios. And what the goal of wargaming is, isn't to give you a solution or an answer. Wargaming is meant to explore ideas and concepts in a safe environment where you can lose and it's okay to lose because, again, the goal is not to, you know, go into a scenario with confirmation bias and hope that the outcome is what you had thought it would be. It's, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just a safe environment to explore those ideas. And so typically the goal is to develop and refine strategies, understand the potential outcomes of different decisions, and improve decision-making skills. And that last part, the improved decision-making skills, is where I believe wargaming really comes into play. 
It goes back to, you know, what I said earlier about a safe environment to lose. Wargaming isn't about winning or losing. It's about improving your decision-making skills. So even if it's the wrong decision, getting repetitions, uh, making those wrong decisions, we believe will eventually uh, lead to a right decision in the future. And so different examples of you know, how wargaming can be used is, you know, financial market predictions, geopolitical instability, logistical planning concerns. And then the big ticket one that's pretty famous is Force Design 2030. And so examples of how you could do that is, you know, if I'm a hedge fund manager and I want to explore, you know, what my risks are in my company, I might have a wargaming consultant uh, to come in and create, you know, a a scenario specific to my company and what we do uh, and essentially just create rule sets and it could be as simple as a, a piece of paper where I have to make decisions and so do my colleagues and that that funnels into a discussion or it could be something else so it doesn't necessarily have to revolve around warfare uh, just because the name has war in it um, it again it goes back to it's just a concept and a system to explore ideas so you know, geopolitical instability, uh, that usually revolves around strategic crisis sims or strategic level wargaming. So you'll usually have players role play certain nations and make decisions. Um, and so you can kind of wargame, okay, you know, what would China's response be to this? You know, if, our, if our, we made policy changes in this direction. And then you would usually have a China subject matter expert playing China if it's an official war game and not just for fun, and they would be constrained to, you know, what China would actually be able to do uh, with their domestic situation. And then logistics planning is pretty self-explanatory. Um, there's plenty of examples of using war game to plan out uh, logistics plans for uh, contested amphibious invasions, aerial refueling plans, things like that. And then Force Design 2030, uh, you know, when you're thinking of new equipment and new organizations to field into combat, there's a plethora of different war games and different models that you can use to say, okay, you know, if the Marine Corps gets rid of all of its tanks, but it supplements that capability gap with X, Y, and Z, what would that look like? And then you would fight out that scenario or, or whatever that uh, entails. Is there any questions so far? All right. So some of the benefits you could get from wargaming is time. Uh, so it could save you a lot of time. Uh, there's a big difference between saying, okay, we definitely want to do that with our company, organization, or unit, um, and then doing that and finding out later on down the road that there were second and third order effects you didn't think about. So now you got to go back to the drawing board. Um, so wargaming won't always be the solution to save you time, but in many instances it can because it goes back to the critical thinking uh, skills that you start to develop. It gets you to explore those different avenues. So if I do make this decision, you know, it's kind of like a, a lot of the times we refer to wargaming like chess, at least with the way that your brain processes it. At a certain point, when you make moves, you start thinking, you know, two, three moves in advance if I do this you know, my opponent or the market or whatever it is that you're wargaming against um, is probably going to do X, Y, and Z. Money kind of ties back into uh, the time. So at Marine Corps University, they've invested heavily in a wargaming cloud capability. Um, while they did pay a lot of money to get that stood up, what that actually does is it saves them a lot of time and money in the future. So now they essentially have a capability that any Marine, no matter where they're at, whether it's in the continental United States, Europe, Japan, uh, they basically just log into a website with their credentials and they could play war games. Uh, so it saves them money in the sense that the units don't have to go out and acquire war games on their own and, and budget for it in that sense. And then innovation, um, depending on the type of war gaming you're doing, a lot of times it, it will breed innovation and it comes from those uh, mainly analytical war games where you might be looking at a different capability when it comes to the military side of house, or maybe you're thinking about a different way to do things at your company that could uh, be more efficient or come up with a better way of doing things. 
And so by wargaming, you can't have a lot of good innovation uh, come out of that. At the very least, you'll have some interesting conversations to explore those ideas. So now we're going to go over the uh, wargaming methods. Um, so I'm not going to go over every single one in existence. I'm really just going to kind of go over the uh, the main ones that I'm familiar with and use because I feel like those are uh, what I'm most qualified to speak on. And for the most part, this is going to encompass what most, uh, most war games are. Uh, so there's three different types. There's tabletop, digital, and hybrid wargaming. Uh, and they are pretty much exactly what they sound like. So tabletop wargaming, you know, it's, it's, it's a war game. So think of board games. When you think of board games, that would be tabletop wargaming. Uh, Warhammer 40K, if you're into science fiction stuff, that's tabletop wargaming. But it usually involves a map, a board of some type. Um, you don't have to have either of those, but that's the most common. Is a map some miniatures or some type of props that represent units or vehicles or whatever uh, type of scenario you're building uh, and then a rule set um, and so that's what tabletop wargaming is so if you're familiar with dungeons and dragons um, monopoly even uh, th those are technically considered tabletop wargaming um, and going back to the idea that wargaming is a concept and not just a specific game or a term you could take a game like Monopoly that most people are familiar with and turn it into a war game. Um, and that's kind of, we'll go over that, but that's kind of the beauty of tabletop war gaming is you're not restricted to um, rules that are already programmed into the system. You, you can take something you like and modify it or keep it and get rid of the things you don't like and create an entirely new system. So digital war gaming is the complete opposite of that. Uh, so it refers to war games that are played on digital platforms such as computers, consoles, or mobile devices. The most commonly used ones you'll find are on computers. Um, these games range from simple turn-based strategy games to complex real-time simulations, and they often include features such as detailed graphics, realistic physics, and sophisticated AI to simulate the complexities of warfare. So for those of you that play computer games, uh, you may be feel familiar with games like Combat Mission or Flashpoint Campaigns. Uh, these are gonna be excellent digital wargaming tools. Uh, really what digital wargaming does is it just takes all the dice rolls that you would have done in a tabletop war game and does it in real time for you. So it cuts out a lot of the friction of waiting to play your next turn and keeps you in the action. Um, there are some other things that digital wargaming does great that tabletop wargaming um, can do, but just not as well, and we'll get into that. But for the most part, digital wargaming is, is just video games, and we try not to call them video games because when you say that, um, people take it less seriously. But you know, even something as simple as you know, Call of Duty could technically be a war game. Um, what I like to tell people when we think about video games or digital war gaming is do we care more about what's being used or the learning objectives? Um, and so if you wanted to teach a squad how to communicate and build unit cohesion and all of that stuff, is it silly to use Call of Duty? Yes, but it can teach them in an environment where it's fun for them and they are communicating 24-7. And then hybrid wargaming is basically just a combination of tabletop and digital together. Um, it is exactly what I just said. Uh, so at Marine Corps University, what we will do sometimes is we'll take a digital war game that does maritime and naval uh, really well, but it might not do ground combat well. And so then what we will do is we will take a tabletop game that we know has a good ground combat system. And we will use that to represent the ground fight while we're playing the digital war game for the maritime uh, in air. Uh, and so really the games can range in scope and complexity and they're often designed to fill gaps and capabilities of either system, uh, which is pretty much what I described right there. So when we usually go to a hybrid system, it's not because we we would like a hybrid system over anything else. Usually you will pick a hybrid war gaming system um, because of a capability gap, you know, maybe you'll pick a title for the tabletop war game portion. That's 90% of the way there. 
Um, but you know, the client or whoever you are wargaming for is really dead set on using a specific software. Uh, then that's kind of how we make those compromises where we say, okay, we'll use the software and we'll use it to augment the overall uh, exercise. Are there any questions on that one? I know I kind of went all over the place. All right. Uh, so tabletop wargaming, this is when we're going to go over the, you know, some of the benefits and some of the uh, obstacles or challenges uh, that each methodology has. So the benefits of tabletop wargaming is modular rule sets. So kind of what I was talking about with Monopoly. Um, with tabletop war games, it's really easy to take a game that, like I said, it might be 90% of the way there or 80% of the way there for what you need. Uh, but maybe, you know, this could act a different way. Uh, so you might tweak the rules. Well, that's what modular rules means. It's very easy to go in and say, okay, I know it says that we need to roll every time we do this. Um, so we're going to roll a, you know, a set of dice for this, but we don't really need that for this exercise because that's not what the learning objectives are. So then you can just cut that rule out. Whereas when you go to a digital game, the computer doesn't really care whether or not you care about that portion of the computation. It's just going to do it no matter what every time. So tabletop wargaming really gives you um, a level of freedom that digital wargaming doesn't. Um, it also gives you hands-on learning. So at Marine Corps University, we found that students or participants in general who might not be familiar with wargaming, it's a lot easier for them to get involved in a tabletop setting because they're physically moving the pieces around. Um, and so they're always engaged instead of just sitting at a computer screen and maybe relying on their teammates to make the moves. Uh, minimal barrier to entry. So depending on the game that you choose, again, because you can change the rules um, this is a, a pretty good benefit, but the minimal barrier to entry just means that you could pretty much teach somebody how to play a tabletop game um, a lot faster than you could teach somebody how to play a digital war game, depending on a lot of factors. But for the most part, it's a lot easier to just set up a board uh, and move some pieces around and show somebody how to play than it is to get them set up on a complex digital software that they may not have used and they might not be a computer person in the first place. And then the can magic move issues. So this gets more into the facilitation portion of wargaming. Um, this does apply to digital wargaming, but it's a lot easier in tabletop because you have the freedom to do whatever you want. So if the players aren't familiar with the rule sets, let's say you're facilitating a tabletop game. Uh, and something needs to happen in the game that isn't a rule and you don't have time to, to write a rule or a new mechanic for that to happen. Um, tabletop Wargaming just allows you to say, okay, this is dead, or I need to move this over here, or whatever needs to happen, and then you can just come up with a real-life reason to explain, you know, why that happens. So, you know, if, if Blue Team loses, uh, you know, an aerial refueling tanker, uh, you could come up with a reason on the spot, you know, as to why that went down as opposed to a digital game where you might not have control over that. Uh, some of the challenges that come with tabletop wargaming is going to be time. So, you know, because it's in person, unless you're using something like Vassal, and I would consider Vassal digital wargaming at that point, um, you're going to have to organize a time for everybody to meet. You're going to have to make sure that everybody can participate in however many hours of play uh, that that is. And it becomes a little bit more challenging than it is to say, okay, hey, just hit me up when you're online and, and we'll continue our game. Um, In-person participation, going back to time, just having to get everybody organized in one spot. It's very easy depending on the amount of players you have, but if you're trying to organize a bigger game, Maybe you need about 40 or 50 people. It can become a little bit more of a hassle, but at that point, you're probably looking at a structured, formalized event anyways. And lastly, solo play. So tabletop wargaming, there are a lot of wargames that do offer um, a rule set called Solitaire. And what Solitaire, I mean, it's basically just like the card game you play by yourself, uh, except it's wargames. So there's certain wargames that do have Solitaire rules 
that try to act as an artificial intelligence so you can play tabletop games solo. Um, but depending on your personality, that might not be adequate. If you're one of those people who find that even when you are making moves for the opponent, you can't just forget, you know, what your plan was previously and allow it to happen and, and all that. So some examples of great tabletop games um, that are pretty easy to learn is going to be Littoral Commander from Sebastian Bay. It is a card driven deck building game. Uh, that focuses on the platoon level, tactical level, South China Sea uh, scenarios. You've got Memoir 44, which is a World War II title. Shores of Tripoli, which is a really great um, beginner-friendly um, Marine Corps war game. And then you've got the next war series, which are a little bit more complex, um, but they're a good example of what tabletop war gaming in the intermediate uh, level would look like. So here's some pictures of tabletop wargaming um, at Marine Corps University. So Littoral Commander is going to be over there in the top right and bottom right. Uh, and that's our uh, fight club, breakfast club meetings that we used to have in the mornings. Um, it's a pretty easy game to teach people how to play. And in the top left and bottom left, we actually have some strategic level tabletop war games. Uh, the one on the bottom left is Marine Corps War College. And the one on the top left, uh, I want to say, is also a breakfast club meeting. But these are kind of what tabletop wargaming looks like. Again, there's there's various forms. They don't all have to have maps and, and boards. Uh, but this is, for the most part, what you're going to see. Uh, this is another tabletop board game. Uh, this is called Wings of Glory. This is a great war game if you're looking at team building, you know, squad level team building or communication. Uh, it has an interesting system where you're not allowed to communicate during the game verbally, but you are allowed to write. Uh, I think the wing commander of each team gets to write five words on a piece of paper in between war, uh, turns. So it's a nice game uh, for planning purposes because essentially both teams make plans at the very start of the game. So now we'll get into digital wargaming. So some of the benefits of digital wargaming are going to just be the antithesis of tabletop. So asynchronous play. A lot of digital wargaming uh, have the ability to essentially send turns back and forth. It's called play by email, but most of them have a system in the game to be able to send those turns without actually emailing each other. Uh, so what this means is that you know, if I am playing a war game against somebody and I don't have time to make my next move for three days, uh, it's very similar to the, you know, chess play by email back in the day where, you know, when I do have time, I'll just load up the game, I'll load the turn up, I'll make my moves and then I'll send it back. So you don't always have to be there at the same time. Uh, and even if you are there at the same time, there are a lot of games that have the ability to play at the same time with each other. Uh, in real time. So it really just kind of gets rid of the logistical hassle of trying to get everybody organized in one spot, set up the board game, and all the cleanup duty associated afterwards. Uh, solo play. So most digital war games will have artificial intelligence to play against. Uh, I put it here not because you can really learn anything from the AI in most of these games, uh, but what you can learn through repetition is, you know, maybe gaps in your plan or it can go through repetitions of planning to get you used to uh, that process if you're a military professional. Uh, so solo play and digital wargaming just kind of gets a benefit here because at any point in time, you can just click play and, and start getting some good education out of it. Data analysis. This is a uh, benefit, but it's going to be restricted to what software you're using. So some of the software at Marine Corps University are professional versions of commercial games that already exist in the public space. And some of them have data analysis features. Uh, so for instance, um, we just did a, a war game where we looked at, you know, what does a drone countermining operation look like? You know, would USVs and UAVs be able to demine uh, an area for, for a contested landing later? Uh, and so what we were able to export from that is basically, okay, how much fuel 
total was used in that operation, how many mines uh, were actually destroyed, how many USVs were destroyed. And so all of that gets exported into a uh, Microsoft Excel document. And so digital wargaming can provide you some of that data analysis if you're looking to do analytical wargames that tabletop games can't really provide. And if they do provide, it's going to require that uh, analyst to sit there and and basically take notes the entire time and do it manually. And then the last benefit that I, I like to point out is visualization of concepts. So again, going back to the, the idea, do we care more about the methods that we're using or the learning requirements? So a lot of times you can use war games that might not have any realism um, if you're just looking to visualize concepts or, or what certain concepts look like. So. Uh, for instance, we might use a game that doesn't have a good ground combat system if the emphasis is on logistics and not actually the combat portion of the ground campaign. Um, so there's things that digital wargaming can do just as a feedback visualization tool. Another example would be, um, let's say you're doing a tactical decision game and you just have um, a scenario laid out before you and you have a course of action that you want to explore well, instead of just writing it down on a piece of paper and having a discussion about it you might have somebody actually put that course of action inside of a digital war game uh, and fight it out just so that you can have a visualization of okay this is what your assault uh, could look like not that it would look like it uh, and sometimes we find that that might help people um, better in their education or their training when they're able to at least look at something that might be 75 percent identical to what it looks like in the real life. Some of the challenges are uh, barrier to entry. So some of these, especially the data analysis, digital wargaming tools out there, some of them do have a pretty high barrier to entry in terms of understanding how to use the software. So a lot of times um, when it becomes when it becomes a higher barrier to entry to the point that there's no education being had because people are fighting the software, we find that it's easier if yourself or uh, somebody who already knows how to use the software basically just facilitates it. So we try to steer away uh, participants from actually using the digital software unless they're already familiar with it. Hardware requirements. Um, if your organization, company, unit doesn't have laptops or doesn't have the uh, hardware to be able to supply uh, a digital wargaming tool, then tabletop wargaming might be better for you. You might be able to just go pick up a couple boxes of games that are suited for what you uh, need right now, and then you can develop a long-term plan to maybe get a laptop or two and, and some copies on there. Spontaneous play. Um, Basically, exactly how it sounds, it kind of goes back to <clears throat> uh, the solo play a little bit. It's a lot harder to just spontaneously uh, play a digital war game. You can't really carry it in your back pocket. Uh, myself, I've carried you know board games to work a couple times during events just so I had something to play during lunch. It's a little bit harder to do that when I'm lugging around a laptop all day. Uh, Maybe the place I'm going to doesn't have Wi-Fi, or maybe the place I'm going to doesn't allow electronics in the building. Um, and then some examples of digital wargaming tools are going to be Combat Mission, Flashpoint Campaigns, Command, Modern Operation, Steel Beast, and Arma. Um, the reason I put Arma there is not necessarily for any educational wargaming, but Arma is a good digital wargaming tool if you're let's say you're a platoon sergeant and you're looking to maybe train some um, individual you know, tasks and battle drills for your enlisted uh, soldiers, Marines, or whoever. Arma is good at being able to go back to that visualization of concepts and say, okay, this is what we do on a reaction to contact, or this is what we do um, you know, when we're doing a movement to contact. And it, it won't give them any real life training but it will get them uh, in the muscle memory and the movements and understanding okay I've seen this before this is what I'm supposed to do and so here's some examples of uh, some digital wargaming tools so flashpoint campaigns is on the left um, and some of these are pictures from Marine Corps University and some of the exercises that we've used them for um, and it's just to kind of give you a visualization of 
you know, what a digital war game looks like and how it might look in a professional setting and how we might use it. And so you can tell uh, nobody's really playing the games in those left two pictures. They're more so pointing at the screen and discussing it. And that's really what the point I'm trying to emphasize here is um, you may in your future, you know, if you decide to pursue this as a job in the industry, you may encounter some culture pushback where people think it's video games. And that's because they get the impression that they're playing the games instead of actually discussing what's happening and uh, how it affects their plan. And so it's just very important to keep in mind that, um, you know, if you are trying to incorporate digital war games into your organization or wherever you might go in the future, um, just because there's a tabletop program already there doesn't mean that they're going to be on board with it. You are going to have to basically sell it yourself um, and fight for it, or at least that's, that's what I found. Um, so this is going to be another example. This is actually a good example of a hybrid digital war game we did. So this is command uh, modern operations on the screen. But in the background on the right hand side, that's going to be some counters uh, in a battle book being made right now for the operational war game system, which is a tabletop war game. And so what we did for this one was um, we essentially had a scenario play out on the tabletop side that was identical to the digital uh, side. So both scenarios were the same, but we had two different student groups playing each scenario. So they both came up with a separate plan. Uh, we both executed that plan and then we just compared the results. So that's, that's just one example of how you might do a hybrid uh, war game. Uh, so this is going to be an interactive tactical decision game, kind of what I was talking about earlier. Um, this is going to be a good way to be a visualization concept for digital war games. We've got a Marine Corps Association uh, Gazette TDG on the left, and we just translated it into Command Modern Operations uh, so that while they're discussing the TDG, uh, they can actually see what those nautical model ranges look like and get that time and distance visualization. This is another way that you can use digital war games. Uh, so this was actually a hybrid done with generative AI. So what we <clears throat> tried to do with this one is essentially we found that students um, were having that high barrier to entry with this digital software. And so I explored using generative AI to basically come up with the missions for them and just had the uh, students double check from a technical knowledge versus a gameplay knowledge. Um, so if you're looking at maybe using general AI or sorry, generative AI, uh, as one of your methodologies going forward to augment either tabletop or digital, this is one way that you can do it. Um, let's say you have somebody who might be in control of a domain they're not familiar with. You can partner them up. Um, as long as there's a human in the loop to double check the information it's spitting out, but you could partner them up with a, uh, generative, generative AI assistant. So this is uh, another example of hybrid wargaming. And right now we're just kind of going over the, uh, you know, different examples so you can get an idea of what they look like. This is a hybrid war game that wasn't a tabletop and digital, but it was a digital and digital. And it was an effort to uh, plug that capability gap. So this is Flashpoint campaigns um, being replicated inside of Command Modern Operations. And if you're unfamiliar with that software, Command Modern Operations, um, it's a very, very good wargaming system to look at maritime and air domains and those problems. It just does not have a ground combat system right now. So this is an example of trying to use Flashpoint campaigns to replicate the ground combat in real time as it's happening um, with the Command Modern Operations maritime and air. So there's different scales at which wargaming happens. This is going to be specific to military conflict wargaming. Um, there are different scales for the business side and the uh, civilian consultancy side. However, I am not familiar with the actual terms, so I do not want to lead anyone astray, but they, they will be similar in concept to how you approach them. 
So tactical war games are a type of war game that models military conflict at a tactical level. And the units typically are either individual vehicles in squads to platoons or companies. Uh, not usually companies. Um, it's mostly at the platoon to individual level. However, there are some war games that use companies. And these units are rated based on types and ranges of individual weaponry. So when you're thinking about tactical war games, the kinds of learning objectives that you're going to explore from those when it comes to professional military education is going to be those tactics and battle drills. So you're really looking at the um, squad leader on up to second lieutenant on up. These are going to be games that look at actual uh, tactics. So uh, bounding overwatch on the very lowest level. Um, you might do some combined arms warfare at the company level. But either way, what tactical war games are is they're basically a way for you to get repetitions in uh, to attack tactical problems. How do I take that machine gun nest? How do I assault that trench? How do I take that town? Uh, so at the very lowest level, that's going to be your tactical war games. Operational war gaming bridges the gap between the smallest level and the highest level. It's not about making decisions uh, for the national interest. So you're not looking at building your own force design or producing more tanks. And you're not necessarily down in the weeds having your machine gunner uh, watch this sector of fire or placing this tank in this position. Operational level war games usually happen across an entire front. Um, and for the most part, operational level war games are fighting at the brigade level, uh, sometimes divisional level. So if you want an example of an operational war game, uh, we'll go down them in the future. But the main thing to learn about is it's kind of like the middle scale. You're not necessarily the president of the United States, uh, but you're not necessarily private first class uh, Williamson either. You know, you're, you're somewhere in the middle. You're, you're a front commander who's only worried about his operational area. And then strategic wargaming. In a strategic level war game, the scope of the simulated conflict is a campaign or even an entire war. Players normally make decisions for the entire nation or organization they are playing. And so for a strategic level war game, typically you'll have players playing the entire nation. So I might be playing as Japan um, and I might be making decisions for the entirety of Japan from policy all the way down to uh, chief of staff. Uh, Secretary of Defense type of stuff for the uh, U.S. So you're really looking at, you know, am I producing enough tanks? Do I need to institute a draft? Uh, you know, where is my energy infrastructure? All of those high-level strategic crisis sims that CSIS puts on or some of these other think tanks where they look at, you know, a flashpoint situation and what leads to it, that's going to be your strategic level wargaming. Uh, and so these are going to be examples of different scales. So this is a tactical level war game. This is going to be combat mission. It's a digital war gaming tool. Uh, and so this is a tactical war game. So while it may be big in scope, um, it's about a company versus a battalion or a company versus a company, it looks like. Um, this is still a tactical level war game because you're controlling, uh, you know, individual squads, individual fire teams, individual vehicles, and you're fighting a very specific tactical problem, which looks like, you know, I need to defend against the BTG coming down the road. Um, you're not worried about anything else. You're not worried about, you know, 50 miles to your left flank or 50 miles to your right flank. So this is a very tactical level oriented war game. Same thing with flashpoint campaigns. Uh, it can fool you a bit because of the map style into thinking it's an operational level game. Uh, but this is still very much a tactical level war game. You might be familiar with it. Um, this has more to do with learning about orders delay and command space and timing. Understanding that if I tell that platoon to go take that hill, uh, it doesn't just happen immediately. They need to form up. They need to organize. They need to get a plan and then they go. Um, but again, this is still a very tactical level war game. Uh, so wargaming systems. So this is 
starting to delve into methodologies just on a deeper level. Uh, but when we talk about these systems, think of them as uh, types of rule sets. Uh, so types of rules that govern the actual war game. So matrix war games are a type of war game that is facilitated uh, using role playing and relies primarily on player arguments and an element of chance to determine the success or failure of player actions. So if anybody has ever had a friend and maybe it's been late at night, and you're tired and you're just talking about silly stuff and you said, who would win in a fight, Batman or Superman? And then you both go over, you know, your arguments. Well, I think Batman would win because, you know, of this reason. And your friend says, well, I think Superman would win. And let's say you both agree that Superman won. At its core, that that is a Matrix War game. And that, that is all a Matrix War game is. Uh, in a more structured format, you might have products that are associated with the Matrix War game. You might have a briefing packet that you need to read um, and some uh, things that tell you what your situation is and what you, you're allowed to do and can't do. Um, but all a Matrix War game is, is it's a scenario and a thought discussion that is put in front of a group of people who are role playing, uh, you know, either different countries or different companies or whatever. It might be cooperative or it might be adversarial. And then you basically just discuss, you know, what you would do, why you would do it. And then whoever's facilitating the war game, uh, usually it's a staff of people who are very knowledgeable on the subject material, will discuss amongst themselves to determine the outcome. Uh, and so this is, it, this is primarily an educational war game designed to get people thinking and to identify what types of things that they are not thinking about. And so you will usually have uh, after action review or some type of debrief after the game where somebody's taking notes of everything that somebody didn't think about when they were, um, you know, submitting their plan. Uh, and then it, it's, it's just a very educational war game. But you don't you don't need anything for it to happen as long as you just have a conversation and can articulate the scenario. But it does help to have props. Creek Spill Wargaming. Um, this is similar to Matrix War Games, except you will actually be physically making moves um, and actually uh, looking at a, a map. So Kriegspiel War Gaming involves at least two teams of players <clears throat> and one umpire. Umpire is exactly like it is in sports. It's a, a facilitator or somebody who just makes sure both sides are playing according to the rules. Um, and you're gathered around a map. So the map usually represents a battlefield. Each team is given command of an imaginary army. Uh, a lot of Kriegspiel games are usually historical, and it's usually the Napoleonic era of warfare. Um, but it could be anything that you wanted it to be. So if you wanted it to be a contemporary scenario, you could. Um, and each block represents some kind of troop formation, such as an artillery battery or a cavalry squadron. So if you've ever seen some of the old pictures or maybe some of the old 1970s uh, World War II movies and you've got the, the general with his little stick and he's moving blocks around a map, that is what a Kriegspiel war game looks like. It is just a map with a bunch of blocks that represent uh, military units. And so the way that that war game actually runs is players command their troops by writing their orders on a piece of paper and giving them to the umpire. The umpire then reads the orders, moves the blocks across the map, and depending on how the umpire interprets um, the situation, they'll execute the orders that were written on the paper. The outcomes of combat are also determined uh, by the umpire's judgment. Usually some creek spill systems have uh, actual combat rules associated with them, um, but they're not really too in-depth like you would see in a computer simulation. Um, so creek spill wargaming is very much um, no computers involved, no dice rolls involved from the player perspective. It is very much uh, looking at a map, seeing the situation for your troops, writing your orders on a piece of paper, and then hoping that the umpire is favorable to you. Um, and some of them get a little bit more complex than that. They're a pretty good time. The educational value that comes out of Creek Spill Wargaming, in my experience, comes from that orders uh, process, writing your orders on a piece of paper. And a lot of Creek Spill Wargames will have a clock similar to a chess clock where you only have so much time to submit your order. 
Uh, and if you don't submit your order, then your, your troops just don't do anything. So there is a lot of educational value if you're a military professional coming out of Creekspill Wargaming, um, just in terms of getting used to you know, making a decision on the fly, and it'll also help you with your course of action um, process. And then if you're a civilian too, I mean, Creekspill Wargaming gives you a, a lot of value on that critical thinking and making decisions on the fly. Um, and I put digital wargaming and tabletop wargaming here just uh, just to kind of round it out because they are systems um, as well as methods. Uh, but essentially all it means is digital wargaming is uh, using commercial off-the-shelf software to facilitate, organize, and execute games across various scales. Commercial off-the-shelf software refers to any public-facing video game that you can just buy. Uh, meaning it's not a professional software. You don't have to contact a company and get somebody to sponsor you for a license. Um, if you can basically launch the internet, buy the game, it's, it's considered a COTS war game. Um, and then tabletop war game, war gaming, it's the same thing. You're basically just using physical props, uh, and dice rolls for your rule sets, most likely. So these are going to be some examples as well. Uh, so this is what I would consider a matrix war game. Um, so this was combat mission <clears throat> being used as a visualization of concept. Essentially, um, we just, somebody took combat mission, looked at a scenario and said, this is what I would do. Printed out the maps, explained, you know, exactly what his course of action would be for his company. This was actually a national guard, um, infantry company commander i want to say uh and he does this on his, his free time as well so this is something that is a current real world example of how digital war games can be used in a in like a thought discussion setting um and, and there's a gentleman out there just doing it on his own uh, so this is a map that was printed out of flashpoint campaigns so uh, i put this in here for two reasons. The first reason is you could use this for a Kriegspiel style war game. Um, so just because you know you have a video game or a digital war game that has some nice maps that you might want to use, um, but you don't want to actually use the game system, uh, feel free to take from those products because I do all the time. Um, so you could use this as a Kriegspiel map, or you could use this as another Matrix games thought discussion. Um, maybe you just put some counters on the map and say, okay, this is, this is the situation, you know, what would you do from here, uh, captain, um, all, all different kinds of things you can do with a simple image. This is an example of a operational level war game, uh, a lot of counters on the map, uh, but believe it or not, this is actually a war game that's in action. So this is going to be a operational war game system. It is a Marine Corps university specific game um, and this is kind of what the operational level looks like so this will be the west pacific uh, operational front and as you could tell you know there's u.s forces here but there is no usa because we're focused on an operational front instead of the strategic big picture and then if you are familiar with europa universalis or any of the paradox interactive games i put this in here because it's a fairly popular and well-known game but this is an example of a strategic level war game. Um, it is not realistic by any means whatsoever. However, it is an example of what a strategic level war game looks like and how you might design one. You know, you are the, um, you are a nation. So you're either Persia, Russia, Kazakh, uh, France, England, you just pick a nation and then you're in control of everything that has to do with that nation. Uh, from manpower and politics and diplomacy down to trade. Um, so when you're thinking about what does a strategic level war game look like, <clears throat> this is kind of a uh, big picture. Most of your strategic level games are going to end up looking like this, just a big map of the world and a bunch of different national interests for you to manage. And then that's all I had for the actual lecture. Um, what I will do is I will go over what the assignment is for Thursday or what's due by Thursday. And then we will go into any questions people have. Um, and I will stay in the discord for a little while. So 
uh, Thursday. The first assignment due is due by 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's just going to be a one-page Word document. And what I want everybody to do is pick a method here. So either tabletop wargaming or digital wargaming or hybrid wargaming. But I would stray away from hybrid wargaming because you might struggle to find a real world example. So let's just stick with tabletop and digital wargaming. So pick one of those methods and then, and I'll write all this down in the Discord as well, but pick one of those methods and then pick one of these systems. And then all I need you to do is essentially research, you know, one of these methods. So either tabletop gaming or digital wargaming, and then tell me basically what I did here, you know, benefits, challenges, and then in the examples, instead of just writing an example, I want you to pick a game. Uh, it could be a digital one if you chose digital, tabletop if you chose tabletop, but I just want you to pick a game, research it a bit, and then tell me what you think that game does well, tell me what you think that game can improve on, and then tell me why you chose uh, that method in that game. So one page minimum can be longer if you want it to, but essentially what I want everybody to do is uh, explore whichever method interests you the most, pick a war game that interests you, and then explore it. Um, and if you need help finding a rule set for it, if you want to look at a rule set, if you want to just watch YouTube reviews, however you want to research it is completely up to you. Um, but essentially, I just want you to find a method that interests you, a game that interests you, and then think about